Good evening, good afternoon, and, and a good morning to all our viewers and our attendants for today's sessions of, of um, as, 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 as day one of um, IT audit practice uh, as course master class. Um, I welcome you all from um, all over the world. Kefa Tusubira, Eddie, are my names. I serve on the board of ISACA, Kampala chapter as a certification director. Um, uh, I welcome you all from um, Africa, Asia, Europe, and Pacific. Um, As we've just started, uh, we have other members from other parts of the, um, the world who, um, who, who are yet to, to, to join us. I suggest that we, maybe we give them a few minutes, one or two, so that they can be able to be a part of the introduction, okay? But as we wait for them, as we wait for them, um, allow me make an introduction. Okay, as I welcome back. Um, we have quite a number of us who have already joined in. So um, allow me to share the, um, the house, house rules. We will not be able to turn on our cameras or the videos or the audios um, as we need to, to, to give maximum time for the presenters to do their work or to make the presentations. Um, in the mid and um, end of the presentations, there will be poll questions that will be, will be coming in. And we expect that uh, um, you, you, do, you do participate in as we go along. Our presenters today, uh, we have to the, them who are staffs of PW, PWC. We have uh, Mr. Peter Ojekunel, who is um, a CJ, a CISA, and, and currently he serves as the risk assurance senior manager at PWC. Uh, on, the, on the list still we have um, Madam Christine Adania, who is a CISA, a C-Risk, CISM, and she serves as a senior associate at, B, at, 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 at PWC. Um, in these two days, we'll be looking at um, the, the basics and the fundamentals of IT auditing. We'll also look at um, auditing IT general controls, auditing IT application controls, auditing IT governance structures, and then auditing cyber security programs. We envision that by, by the end of all this, or by the end of the two days, we'll have gone out with knowledge, skills, and experiences on how to actually uh, have hands on and audit these various areas in our organizations. So uh, before 
we take a lot of time. Allow me to invite Madam Christine Adania to give us a presentation. Uh, just before she comes in, uh, in case you have any questions regarding any of the topics here, um, feel free to, to, to type the questions in the, in the chats. We'll be able, there is a panel of, um, of experts in terms of the same areas that we'll be looking at today, who will be able to answer the questions. And then also Madam Christine Hassoff, I know she will be able to answer or to take on quite a number of questions. So at this juncture, join me in welcoming Madam Christine Adair. You're welcome, Christine. Thank you so much, Kefa. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, you are welcome to this session. We hope that you not only go back with a peak in interest um, for IT auditing, but you also pursue a career in IT auditing. I know a lot of you have joined today in hopes of understanding what IT audit entails and probably assessing whether you it's something that you would like to do. So um, without further ado, we're just going to um, start our presentation. Um, as Kemfa mentioned, there will be a panel, a panel of um, experts that will be able to answer any burning questions um, by, by, by you posting them in the chat. And um, should there be any glitches, uh, please do reach out to any of the panelists. Thank you. Okay, um, so this session is supposed to run from today uh, till tomorrow. Um, it will cover the areas below. We'll look at uh, basics and fundamentals of IT auditing, auditing of IT general controls or what most of you know as ITGCs or in some industries they call it um, GITC, something like that. I'll we'll also look at how you can aud uh, audit application controls, um, a lot of you know it as input and output controls uh, for IT. Other people call it ID dependencies. We'll also look at how to audit IT governance structures and we shall finalize with um, cybersecurity programs. Um, the schedule is that today we shall look at the basics and fundamentals of IT audit. We shall then also have a look at some parts of um, IT general controls. I'm sure when someone tells you that audit, uh, IT auditor the, the, the first thing that comes to your mind is ITGCs because usually that's all, um, that's, that's what the world perceives of IT auditors. So we'll cover a part of ITGCs today and um, the pending um, items will be covered tomorrow because it's quite broad. I will also cover IT uh, application controls tomorrow um, and IT governance structures and cybersecurity programs. So um, the objectives of this training will be for you to be able to link um, IT governance and then the risks and controls, how they all mesh together in a business environment or in an, in an enterprise-wide environment. And then for you to be able to um, evaluate the design effectiveness of controls and to further on go ahead and assess operating effectiveness of controls. So if we can just uh, go on to uh, the basics of and fundamentals of IT auditing. So in this session, we'll cover um, just five key things. What do we understand by IT auditing? What are the processes involved in IT auditing? Um, the common times you, you find in IT audit. What are the frameworks that support IT auditing? And what basic skills do you need um, as an IT auditor? So IT auditing involves assessment of IT related controls put in place to ensure that controls protect information technology assets and ensure integrity and are aligned with organization goals and objectives. So in a normal um, uh, business environment here, yeah, there will be a lot of uh, processes that are going on. And because of 
um, need for efficiency and effectiveness management or, or, or the board of directors um, and the owners of the, of the business who want to um, implement IT just for purposes of efficiency, um, to achieve a level of automation. And with the use of IT dependence, um, IT uh, in business comes a risk, yeah? So um, there are risks related to use of IT in an environment. What the business then does is it implements controls, um, a way of a, a defense mechanism, yeah, against these risks that are presented by the use of, of IT in a business environment. Now, you, your job as an IT auditor is to go ahead and give some sort of comfort and do some kind of assessment to say, okay, the controls that you have implemented in your environment adequately address the risks that are presented to you by these IT objectives and they will not pose a threat or if they pose a threat it is to a minimized level because of your use of controls that are operating designed effectively first of all and then are operating effectively um, so what are the processes that are involved in IT auditing so the major objective um, when uh, they call upon you as an IT auditor is one, confirm safeguarding of assets such as data objects, resources to house and support information systems. Yeah, you also have to ensure that um, data is maintained with a level of efficiency, there's aspects of confidentiality, there are compliance to data rules, the data is available and there's some degree of integrity to that data and the information that is being generated by use of this data is reliable to whatever stakeholders that may be using this information. So we have four key phases of um, IT audit. One is planning, where you will perform preliminary assessments, you will gather information, you will understand the business, what exactly does it do, what kind of industry does it operate in, what are the risks that are presented um, by the innate nature that it's operating in a certain industry then you go ahead and define your audit objectives. What would you want to achieve at the end of um, this audit? Um, then you will draw a scope once you have defined your uh, objectives. Um, you, want, you need to draw a scope because we don't want scope creeps. You, you'll find yourself starting with audit of one system. At the end of the day, scope has crept in and you've audited 24 systems. So it needs, um, you need to tailor your audit scope to a specific process. And, to those specific objectives that you had drawn. Then once you have um, defined objective, um, um, drawn your audit scope, you go ahead and collect evidence and then evaluate that evidence uh, for sufficiency and appropriateness. Then at the end of the day, you document that evidence in a proper manner and also go ahead and perform reporting. Um, other common objectives of IT is usually just to review uh, security infrastructure and systems. You can just be called upon uh, just to, to uh, review the controls that are um, around uh, security infrastructure. You can just be called upon to uh, give some kind of comfort for the safety of IT systems that are in place and also examining uh, development process and procedures for various stages of the system. This is usually for um, businesses that do in-house development of systems. And then you'll also be uh, probably called on to perform um, uh, evaluation for, for a performance of a specific system. Let's say maybe in a bank, there's a, a core banking um, system that has recently been launched and now they've used it for a year, they want to know, is it actually giving us what we want? Is it meeting the objectives that we had initially set it to do? So um, that's the main process. I didn't let, if we just go um, on to um, IT planning, what exactly is entailed in IT planning? As mentioned earlier, you will start with understanding the entity and its environment, and we'll delve in this um, in the next slide for what you need to do to understand the entity and its environment, and why is it important that you do that? Once you understand the entity and its environment, you can then be able to pick key risks that are related to the use of IT in the business, yeah? Because um, a decision to, to use IT will also come with certain threats. By the fact that, by the virtue of the fact that you're using IT, there will be threats, there will be risks. 
Yeah. And then once you have identified the risks, then you will go on and identify the controls or measures that have been put in place to mitigate the crystallization of those risks, to ensure that the risks, however much they may be there, are reduced to are either done away with or they are reduced to um, a level with which management is comfortable with. And then you will then go ahead, um, develop a scope and a budget uh, based on the risk assessment that you perform because now you know, you know the risks that you need to address. So based on that risk assessment, you will go ahead and draw um, a scope tied directly to that risk assessment. Like I mentioned earlier, if you just develop a scope without um, an objective or without risk that you're looking to address, you may end up running the audit forever. It will never end. There will be new things that are coming to light every day. So um, that's why you need to make sure that your, your, your scope is clear, it's precise, and you know what you're doing. Um, moving on to understanding the entity and its environment, um, there are key factors. Then there are also industry-related factors. These are factors based on the fact that someone has decided to do maybe um, financial services, yeah? Or someone has, go, has, has decided to go into the manufacturing industry or the telecommunications industry. Then there are other factors that may just affect um, the entity as a general. So key factors could include, um, you need to look at the business description. What exactly? does the entity do, yeah? How do they make their money? What are the regulatory and legal um, aspects that surround the operation of that business, yeah? What are the general economic conditions in that market? So if, let's say, it's a, it's a banking industry, let's say, what are the economic conditions that surround the banking industry? Um, how many branches does this bank run? What are the locations? How are they located? Um, what is the governance structure? Who owns this, this, this uh, business? What are their key strategies? What are their key risks? And what are their objectives? Then moving on to industry factors, it could be something like, do they face um, a lot of competition? Um, what is their relationship with, uh, with suppliers and customers like? What are the most recent technological developments? And have they um, made a step to adopt those uh, technological uh, um, developments. If they do have uh, those developments in the environment, then you may want to consider the risks that arise with the, the, the technological developments. I want to stress this point because we are now talking about IT audit and it's um, an everyday thing that new systems are being implemented. IT is uh, just um, usually just changing the way people do things. Today, you may find um, management is using one system, tomorrow they have moved to a completely different system. So you need to keep that in mind. And then you may also want to consider any other recent changes in the industry, um, probably because of um, um, facts, let's say now COVID, we, we know COVID-19, a lot of us are, are working from home. Um, I don't know when I was last in office. So there are things that come with the um, just the environment or the things that are just out of our control, yeah? So what key risks do they bring to your IT audit? You may want to consider. Then other factors include accounting principles and relevant financial framework being applied. This is for my people who are doing um, financial audit. Uh, this knowledge is also important because IT does not just sit alone. IT is there because it's um, assisting a business, yeah? It's implemented to ensure effective and, and efficient operation of a business. So at the end of the day, management wants to make money. The owners of the company and the business want to make money. They're looking for ways in which they can make money um, easier. You may, know, you, you may want to link um, how IT is, up, is applied in ensuring that these accounting principles and relevant accounting standards are complied with. Then you can have government policies um, recently um, about four or five years ago, BOU just woke up one, one morning and said, you know, um, financial, um, in the, uh, the, the, the financial services, we shall be performing um, 
ICT audits for your environment every after two years. So you may also want to consider such things. Then there are also environmental and social requirements. Okay, so let's move on to the terms that you uh, meet during your IT audit. You've had risk being mentioned a lot. Risk comes in different categories. You have inherent risk, you have control risk, you have detection risk, residue risk, and audit risk, which I'll define this in just a few minutes. So um, in a general manner, risk is just a collection of internal and external factors, which may affect the ability of the organization to meet its objective meet its object objectives what is that thing that keeps management awake at night saying okay i have laid my plans i need this business to succeed but there is something that is threatening um and and might crystallize and make sure that these objectives are not met those are the risks that we are looking at so risks are measured in terms of impact and likelihood um impact meaning what is the effect if this risk comes to pass, if this risk is not addressed, what will happen? Then the likelihood is to do with, is it, is it likely? I'm now using the same word. Is it possible? What's the possibility? What's the probability that this risk will crystallize? That's what they mean by likelihood. So um, the categories of risk, we have inherent risk. So inherent risk is just risk that is innate by the fact that you have made a decision to invest in a certain industry, let's say telcos, there are risks that, are come, that come with that industry. So you may find that the risks that are being faced by um, the, the telecommunications industry is totally different from the risks being by, uh, faced by manufacturing companies, let's say. So the risks that you've chosen to drive, um, the risks that you face because you've chosen to drive will be totally different um, from that person who has chosen to walk, yeah? So this is what we say is inherent risk. It's just innate by nature of existence. Uh, a control risk is, is the risk that the controls that you have um, put in place may not detect or prevent um, or, or errors or, or, or misstatements um, in the environment. So you've established your controls, but for one reason or another, they have missed they have missed their target, yeah? So that also presents a risk. And then you have residual risks. So I've been mentioning that once you have um, performed your risk assessments, you've identified your risks, you know the likelihood, you know the impact if you do not address those risks, then your business um, implements controls in the environment to address those risks, yeah? So now once the risks have been addressed by those controls, there is a level of risk that remains. That is what we call residual risk, yeah? Because you cannot address um, the ideal environment, you would want to address risk 100% end to end, yeah? You, you know that things are not going to go wrong, but what comfort do you have? What guarantee do you have that those things are not going to go wrong? So there is a residual risk, even if you address it to um, a different um, a certain percentage there is going to be some risk that is remaining. Of course, it's different for um, different companies depending on the effectiveness of their controls. Then you have detection risk. Now this detection risk is usually for um, auditors. Yeah. So once you you've designed your audit procedures, yeah, there is a probability that your audit procedures will not be able to pick out those errors, pick out the, the, the misstatements. Yeah in the process of your audit. So there is that risk. First, because most auditors, all auditors, our audit is performed on a sample basis because it's efficient and you, can, you can't just wake up one day and do 100%. Now there is use of cuts for that, but it's possible that your sample will miss a certain aspect. So you may not be able to detect that error. So audit risk is just um, a product of inherent uh, control and detection risks. Now we move on to internal controls. So internal controls, like I said, is just a process affected by a board or management or other personnel um, to provide reasonable assurance regarding the achievement objective of objectives in the categories of efficiency and effectiveness of operations, and then reliability of financial reporting, and also compliance with applicable laws and 
regulations. We will we'll understand this deeper as we go on. So there are types and categories of internal controls. So there are three types of internal controls. Um, there could be more, but most likely they will fall under these three types. We have the manual types where uh, it requires human intervention, yeah? Then you have the automated type, which is just the, the opposite of the manual. It's, just, it's done by the system without any inter in human intervention end to end. IT dependent manual controls on the other hand um, require some level of human intervention. So maybe at the start, uh, it's initiated by a human. So um, you go and start a system or, or click on something, then the system is able to um, automatically run that process. If you do not start it, the system will also do nothing. So that is um, what we mean by IT dependent manual controls. Then um, controls are also categorized into three types. There is preventive, detective, and corrective. Preventive is the, um, the controls that are put in place to stop um, an error, or, or misfunction before it actually happens. Notice the word before. Um, detective is after. So can um, the controls be able to identify the errors after? If they can, then those are detective controls. And then you have the corrective controls, which are, are very rare, but they're there. Um, they're now becoming even more common. So what they're designed to do is to repair damage or restore resources. Um, following an authorized or unwanted um, activity. So they put everything back to the way it was before. So um, just an example, manual controls would be um, physical file sign-offs. So maybe you, want, you have a, a purchase order um, and you need your supervisor to sign off, get a pen and sign it off. Automated would be um, backup of data files. Um, most times it's just scheduled to run maybe at midnight. midnight with the, whether you're there or you're not there, the, the file is going to run. Then you have system automated computations and approvals. Um, what can, example can I give? So in, in a, all of us have bank accounts in, um, and we, we have savings. And so interest is usually computed on those savings, yeah? But no one sits there every day to compute, okay, Christine has a balance of this today. Let me get this, let me get the percentage and compute. There are millions of users in a bank. So it is not possible that a human can do this. So what the system does is just, it's configured to say, pick the rate, pick the balance, do your multiplication, um, do the rates and post to relevant accounts. So that is done end to end by the system. Then you have IT dependent manual controls. Um, you have system aided reconciliations, for example, there are two, uh, reports are generated from two systems and then they're loaded onto uh, um, that reconciliation system by maybe um, a, a, a human. And then once they're loaded, they're arranged in a certain format. Then once they're arranged in a certain format, you click initiate and then it starts matching. Okay, column A, to column B, column C, to column D. And then it, it throws up exceptions. Then you go and physically, manually resolve those um, exceptions. So that would be an example of IT dependent. Other, others include swipe cards and biometric machines. Yeah. Um, example of a detective control will be intrusion detection systems, um, physical inventory checks to, to ensure that everything is in place. Um, you have preventive controls, including a segregation of duties to ensure that no fraud occurs, and then um, authorization by appropriate personnel. Corrective actions would be patching systems, terminating a process, rebooting a system. Um, in some environments, in very highly sophisticated environments, you'll find that um, for things like system security or, or perimeter security, that all these three categories have been um, implemented, yeah? So there is a preventive, there is a detective, and there is a corrective control. So usually you have like maybe a perimeter firewall to prevent um, any kind of intrusions. Then you have your intrusion detection system that once the, the maybe the hackers have gone through your, your firewall, now it will start generating um, alerts. This has happened, this has happened, this has happened. Then there is 
a, a, a rebooting system that says, okay, we are under attack. What should we do? Reboot the system. So in, in sophisticated environments, you'll find that all these three are being applied in certain instances. Um, so let's move on to audit evidence, yeah? How do you collect audit evidence? What, what approach do you take? So um, I've categorized them into four. There could be more, but most likely they'll, likely they'll follow under these four. So you can use inquiry. For this, you'll just need interview skills, yeah? You'll need to um, um, inquire of knowledgeable persons. You just don't go uh, maybe to a, a gatekeeper or like an office um, career and say, okay, how does this system operate? You need to know, identify the persons uh, who know the system. And then during inquiry, you should ensure that your questions are clear and concise. They are um, uh, objective and they're open-ended. So what I mean by open-ended questions is the hows and the what. You just don't go and say, okay, uh, do you perform backups? The person will tell you yes. Um, do you ensure that levers are terminated in a, a, in a timely manner? Yes. Um, do you perform review of privileges activities? Yes. Everything will be yes, yes, yes. And you'll find that you've gone out of the edit with just zero, you've identified zero gaps, yeah? Because your question approach to start with is, is, is just off. So open-ended questions will be like, how do you ensure that users are terminated in a timely manner? So you put the person in a position where they have to describe the process. They just can't say yes, because the answer would even be so, yeah? What do you do to ensure that? You see, the way you structure your questions will, will um, affect the quality of your audit because after that, you will have to um, do follow-up questions. You, uh, things may come to light, um, that would not otherwise um, have been identified if you had used maybe closed-ended questions, yeah? And then um, when you have inspection, one other thing I've forgotten is you cannot use inquiry alone. You can't use it as your only means of collecting evidence because it's, it's clearly not reliable, humans lie. So, so you kind of someone and they'll say that we have this, we have this, we have this, you collect your computer, collect your books, collect your pen and go, we finish the audit. You come up with nothing. So you have to use it in conjunction with other approaches, which I'm going to describe just down here. You have inspection. This is just physical examination of records or documents, whether internal or they're coming from out, whether they're in paper form or electronic form, whether it's a physical examination of an asset or media. So um, when you're examining um, evidence using inspection, you have to keep uh, certain things in, in, in copy, uh, in mind, um, things like the quality of evidence that you're examining. This will be, we'll attack this later. Um, but for example, if they present you with um, a photocopy of the evidence versus the original, of course you have to choose the original. Um, typically, uh, written evidence is more reliable than oral evidence, a recording or something. And then evidence that is coming from a third party may be more reliable than evidence that is coming from the ODT, the person being audited. Um, then we have reperformance, which um, involves the use of the auditor's independent execution of procedures that were originally performed as part of the entity's internal control. So this is usually used for um, maybe mathematical calculations or um, computations that are done uh, by someone or by the system. Okay, so on a certain day, um, let's say A plus B plus C will give you D. That's what the ODT is telling you. If under those same conditions, you do your additions of A plus B plus C, does it give you D? If it gives you E, you, you will have to, of course, follow up and say, okay, I've done it the same way you have done it. How is it possible that I have come up with that? Totally different conclusions from what you have come up with. And then we have um, observation. It's just looking at the process um, being performed by others. Um, 
things like phys physical inventory accounts of personnel or performance of control activities. Um, also, you have to be careful when you're using observation because people are prone to just do things in a correct manner when someone is watching them, yeah? So if there is no one there, they probably wouldn't have gone through the, the, the entire process address all control points, but because you, the IT auditor is there, they are now prompted to do the thing correctly. So um, uh, you have to be very, very careful when you're using observation. And I, I suggest that you also use it in conjunction with um, other evidence like, like uh, physical reports or, or, or um, reperformance for calculations, which let's say they are performed, something like that. So we have gone on to the concept of appropriate and sufficient evidence. These are two completely different things. You'll find people saying appropriate sufficient evidence to mean one thing, two different things. Appropriateness speaks to the quality of evidence, while sufficiency speaks to the quantity of evidence. Yeah. Quality would be something like, um, so in my opinion, you first have to determine the quality of evidence before you go on to the quantity of evidence. If they present you with uh, maybe a physical record of something or an approval, does it, does it give you that warm fuzzy feeling? Does it give you that comfort that you're seeking for? Once it has given you the comfort that you're seeking for, then you go ahead and order uh, for more um, evidence and say, okay, you've given me for one month. May I possibly have a look for, um, look at the evidence for maybe four months because you are now satisfied with the quality of evidence that is being presented. If we just uh, look at these receipts here, you have two. So my question to you would be like, which one gives you uh, more comfort? Which one do you feel more comfortable using in your um, audit documentation? Obviously it would be the one on the left because um, first of all, this one um, just has a, uh, a, head, a headed paper, everything is written. There is no uh, evidence of review. There is no signature of the person who did. There is no debt. You can't trace it to anyone. So it's not reliable, yeah? Then you have this, uh, which has indication of the debt. It has a telephone contact. You can always uh, do your callback procedures, um, call this person and say, okay, confirm for me the balance of this thing. So this is what we mean by, um, the quality of evidence, yeah? Um, so let's move on to the concept of design and operating effectiveness, which usually confuses a lot of people. Um, when you look at a test of design effectiveness, there are questions that you need to ask. One, does the control exist for the risks that you have identified in the organization? because it's possible that they don't even know, the business doesn't know the risks that are presented by use of IT, by the use of IT. So the risks are just staring at them in the face, nothing is being done to address it. So you first have to ask, have controls being implemented to address these risks that you have identified um, in the business environment? So what do you do to answer that question? Inquire of knowledgeable personnel like Alia said, and then if they confirm to you that they're actually controls, you will have to perform a walkthrough for each in-scope control. What I mean by a walkthrough is an end-to-end -end, um, process uh, where you will have to address each of the control points because it's possible that um, the control points at the beginning the control is being is designed, it's operating well. In the middle there, they're not doing something. Then at the end, someone signs off and say, okay, now the control is operating effectively um, without giving any consideration to the design. So what you'll probably do during a walkthrough is just pick one sample. Let's say you are testing the fact that livers are terminated in, um, a successful manner. So you'll inquire uh, maybe of the IT manager and say, okay, what is your process for ensuring that levers are terminated in a successful manner? Then the reply will probably be, you know, uh, we have policies that say on, on, on such and such a day before the effective exit date of the lever, 
HR will send a notification to IT to ensure that uh, these levers are deactivated. When we receive the notification, we'll go ahead and de deactivate the user from the system, then make communication back to HR and the, the, levers, um, the levers line manager to say we have deactivated. So they've described to you a process. So probably have policies for this. Now what you'll do is from your population, you pick one sample and say, okay, walk me through this process using this one sample. Kristen left on such and such a day. What did you do? So once they have, once they walk through you through that process and you see at each point, whatever the policy describes is being met, then the control has been designed effectively. So that is a walkthrough, what we mean by a walkthrough. So um, uh, another question would be, is the design of the control uh, possible, um, able to prevent or detect the error as intended, yeah? So what you'll do is assess the results of your work to determine if the risk has been addressed, just like I said, and then you will proceed to perform um, a test of operating effectiveness, which we'll look at in a minute. So most times, um, IT auditors will just go ahead and um, uh, perform uh, tests of control, uh, tests of operating effectiveness without assessing the design. It's, it's possible that something will be operating beautifully end to end, but does the design address the risk? Let me give you an example of backup. If you walk into a, 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 um, a business and they tell you, oh, we perform backup of our data on an annual basis. It's good they perform backup. It's good. It's what it's needed to be done. But is the frequency appropriate? Yeah. So you'll find for very, very volatile environments like uh, the banking industry, some of them even do backup three days, uh, three times in a day. So if you perform backup at the end of the year, even if you get that, that one um, evidence of the backup and you see they did everything right, it's possible that during the year, a lot of things could have happened, yeah? A lot of things. So that is the concept of the test of design effectiveness. Now, for the test of operating effectiveness, you're basically asking, okay, now that the, uh, the control has been designed to address the risk end to end, nothing is peeping at you, nothing is just tearing at you in the face like a risk, is um, the control working or oper being operated consistently during the period under review. So when you're looking at uh, maybe a period of 12 months and they tell you the control is operated in a, on a monthly basis, you'd expect that if you just close your eyes and pick June, they'll be able to present you with the exact evidence that they presented you during your walkthrough. Every control point is being addressed at each point and you are able to confirm that um, that control is operating consistently like the way it was designed to operate. So that is the uh, concept of operating effectiveness. So what you need to do to um, assess the uh, operating effectiveness of the control is select a suitable sample size that should be representative of your uh, total population and then um, walk through those control points or control characteristics for each um, of those samples, yeah? So if you've selected maybe say five samples, you go through um, and just high level uh, uh, control characteristics walk through, not now the intensive thing you did at design because now you have the comfort that the design is actually able to address the risk. So now you're coming to say, okay, is it now working flawlessly flawlessly throughout the year. So that is what we seek to address when we do a test of operating effectiveness. I hope we've captured this in our minds because it confuses a lot of people. Okay, so let's go to the nature, timing and extent of testing. Yeah. So um, we'll assess level of, of testing. If you want um, a higher, a, a higher um, assurance or higher comfort for level of testing, the this, uh, the nature of tests that you have to perform is reperformance and inspection. As, uh, as expected, 
or as I mentioned earlier on, you would really, really, the quality of evidence that you get out of observation and inquiry is very low, very, very low. So um, you have to use it in conjunction with these that they consider um, for higher levels of evidence. Um, so if we go to uh, extent of testing, yeah, a higher level of evidence will come from obviously testing 100% of the, of the population, but how efficient is that? Yeah, so then the next best thing is sampling. So you say, okay, uh, maybe you have five business units. I'm going to pick a sample for each of these business units so that the, the, your sample represents your actual, to, to, um, your actual population. And um, the next thing you will have to do if you choose not to do something is select a, a specific items. Yeah, so you will just say, okay, I'll just select um, items that were done on this date because I've seen somewhere that they did some, they maybe developed a system on that day. I'll go and pick evidence from that day. So that's what you do. And then the least form of level of evidence will be a test of one. Yeah. But um, there are instances where you can perform a test of one for automated controls, though not under ITGCs. We'll look at this uh, later uh, during our training. Let's go to sampling methodology. We have heard um, a lot about sampling. Sample should represent your population. Um, so what is sampling? So it's a method used to yield an equal probability that each unit um, in the population could be selected. So the, time, the types of uh, sampling that you do is stratify the hazard, there's personal judgment, there is random sampling and systematic sampling. Stratified is basically just um, doing a split or grouping your items in a, in a certain, um, maybe um, certain batches and say, okay, I'm just going to select one from each batch that would be stratified. Then we have haphazard uh, sampling. As you hear it, there is no structure. You just go picking anyhow. Um, and then you have personal judgment, uh, which is one of my favorite to use. Um, the, the auditor uses uh, own judgment to select items, perhaps favoring items which appear to have a higher level of risk associated with them. Yeah, remember we perform risk-based IT audits. So if something presents a higher level of risk, you should probably um, pick it out. For example, let me go back to the example of you testing uh, that livers are terminated on a timely basis. You have a population that probably includes um, a, a financial accountant, you have a procurement manager, you have a stores keeper, you have maybe a loader, you have an office assistant, you have um, um, all these kinds of people. And then somewhere, somewhere down, you have a database administrator that left during the year. But now uh, if you use haphazard sampling, your, your sample methodology probably didn't pick that uh, database administrator. But by the fact that the person is a database administrator, that presents a higher level of risk. You would want to look at it, yeah? Because the, the, the rights that are usually given to database administrators are very, very, um, are higher than um, the ones for normal business users. Random sampling would include um, making just a random number generator and just, just making decisions based on the numbers that are generated for each, uh, um, each item in the population. There's also systematic sampling where you say you'll pick every 20th item. We have use of computer assisted audit techniques, which you, 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 most of you know as CATS. Uh, why is it, why are they used? They improve efficiency and effectiveness, leading to increased audit coverage, and then also um, reduction in risk because you can be able to perform 100% for the population, 100% tests. So examples would include generalized audit software, customized queries, scripts, utility software, and audit expert systems. If I give particular examples, most of you know SEL, most of you know Alteris, most of you know Power BI. Um, 
those, those are just some, but there are also specific queries that are run by experts, yeah? And then what, what would you use them for? Most times they're used for um, analytical review or what people call DA data analytics, but you can also use them for testing your ITGCs, application controls, and then test of details for transactions and balances. Ensure that you exhibit professional care in use of cuts because they produce a large population of evidence on an IS audit, yeah? So if you, if you choose to rely on um, cuts, make sure that everything is being done right because you're basically picking 100% and relying on that. Um, so there's some guidance provided by ISACA for use of cuts. I'm just going to quickly run this through. We have um, decision factors. What, um, what should inform your decision? during the use of CATS, you have uh, computer knowledge, um, expertise, you should be an experienced IS auditor because you start low and then climb higher. Yeah, you don't want to run before you walk. Um, you have uh, availability of uh, suitable CATS. Do you have the CATS that you actually want to use? Because it's one thing to want to use CATS, then there is one thing, it's another that you actually, those CATS or all the tools that you want to use available to you. Um, um, also, you have to assess whether it's, it's more efficient and effective to use cuts over manual techniques. There are times when manual techniques may be much, much faster. Then as, assess the time constraints around your audit, and then also assess the uh, integrity of the information system and the IT environment that is generating your data for use because garbage in, garbage out. Um, planning steps, what should you do in planning? Ensure that you set your ob uh, audit objectives, um, determine accessibility and availability of the data and systems. So you go into an environment with the mindset to use my cuts. I already have my ACL tool somewhere. They should give me everything that I need, but do the, the organization system, do they have limitations in availing you that data that you want to use? Um, also, you have to know your data understand the composition, the format, the layout, um, the quantity of the data, because something can just crush your entire computer, um, define your procedures that you will take and then document the cuts to be used. Um, ensure that you test those cuts before you actually place reliance on them, yeah? So um, through um, access for reliability, the usefulness and, and, and level of security that is attached to the use of these cuts because you're basically just, like I said, you're putting 100% there. So you'd want to assess whether you can actually um, rely on these cuts before, before jumping in and using them. Then um, what do you do during the performance of audit work? Um, ensure that you perform reconciliations of control totals if it's appropriate. Review the up output for reasonableness because you don't want to run your queries and then at the end of the day, it's generating for you cats and dogs. You don't understand the output at all. You're expecting something different. It has yielded something completely, completely different. And then perform a review of the logic and the parameters or other characteristics of the cats. If it's probably this is after you have determined that it's not giving you what you want. And then also review the organization's general IC con IS controls. IS we mean information system controls. And then Perform reporting, yeah. During your report, ensure you 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 documenting you document extensively the objectives and the scope and the methodology, yeah. But the description of the cuts should be clear because even to management, because your report will go to management, IT things confuse a lot of people. <laughs> so it's better if you use clear, concise, straightforward language. You don't um, use um, the lingua that is for IT. Um, probably deep IT people, just use something that they can understand. Um, then we move to professional skepticism, what I usually call the auditor sixth sense. Yeah, you must, most of you have had that thing called the sixth sense. So this would be equivalent of the sixth sense for auditors. Um, it, it means having a questioning mind, being alert to conditions that may indicate possible misstatement due to fraud or error, and um, pose a risk to critical assessment of audit evidence. Why does it matter? Um, 
um, because it enhances the, the quality of your audit, yeah? And you'll be prompted to ask questions that you'll probably not be, uh, not have asked in the, under different conditions. So if you see something that is perturbing you, that is out of the ordinary, that is, you're not used to that circumstance, please go ahead, follow your instincts, ask the questions. If at the end of the day, it doesn't generate something meaningful, then you don't lose anything, just probably a little bit of pain. But if you miss it, there is, there might be a huge impact to your audit, a huge impact that extends even before you, uh, um, beyond your audit, yeah? So ensure that if you see something amiss, um, and this actually requires you to keep your antennas very, very high, your ears on the ground, be alert, be, 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 be alert. And when do you apply it to throughout the entire auditing period, and for people, for some of the IT auditors that would sit within the business or the, the part of the internal audit, you will have to apply it in your everyday life. Every time when you're walking, every time when you're breathing, you will have to be skeptical. And then some of the elements would include, um, by elements would mean what would you need? You have to know uh, what you're doing as an IT auditor. You, you have to have the skill, you have to be, able to have that ability to pick um, peculiar circumstances, um, have a mind of integrity and objectivity. So probably because the finance manager is your friend, you just ignore something that is that does not sit right with you. So exhibit integrity and, and objectivity, perform robust risk assessments, um, perform diligent gathering and evaluation of your evidence to ensure that you pick out those gaps pick out what is amiss because you, you have to pay attention to what you're doing. Um, so, so IT auditors as a general, you just don't go in and, and, and check boxes and say, okay, did we do this? Yes. Um, did we apply, did we do test ITGCs? Yes. You don't give details. Ensure that um, your evaluation of evidence is top notch. Ask those probing questions, yeah? Um, people usually feel uncomfortable when you ask those probing questions, but that is what will generate you some comfort. That's what will give you a warm, fuzzy feeling in your tummy as an IT auditor. Um, then we moved on to reporting. So after you performed your, your IT audit, you have to um, generate some kind of um, audit report that will probably go to the managers, if not to the board of directors. And... Um, it should ensure that you have a brief summary of, of, of what you did, the description, and then um, uh, include in your executive summary the, the significant findings, and then any recommendations suggested. So ensure that your executive summary uh, section is very, very clear because sometimes, um, especially at the board level, people don't have time to go down to to your details and say, okay, we looked at passwords, blah, blah, blah. They will just look, they will just look at something that picks their interest in the executive summary. And then if it picks their interest, they may, they may be go down and look at the details. And then um, you will have a detailed section for findings and recommendations. Then you have appendices probably to include any extra material, any tables, any graphs to support your research, um, but they may not directly relate to you findings or your recommendations. Okay, then we go to information processing objectives. What are we auditing against? Keep these things in mind. Um, I like to call them caviar, but they clearly don't spell out caviar. So uh, we have completeness to ensure that all transactions that, are occurred, that have occurred are accepted and entered only once. You don't have duplicates, you don't have um, omissions. So that's the aspect of completeness. Accuracy is recorded in correct amount, in an appropriate account, in a proper period. Validity is that only authorized transactions that actually occurred are, um, are related to the organization. So you are not recording something that uh, you know, you're not accepting all the rubbish, yeah? It's valid and only valid. Then there is restricted access, which is a very, very, very important objective. Um, 
here what we are basically assessing is that data and physical assets are protected against unauthorized amendments and access to confidential data is restricted to authorized personnel. You just can't allow everyone to do everything because people are malicious and they will do things to your data and you wonder what is going on. So yeah, that's the aspect of restricted access. Every time you perform an IT audit, keep these elements in mind. Keep in mind that you have to confirm completeness. You have to confirm the accuracy of that data. You have to confirm that that data is actually valid and they're not cooking for you something that is totally not related to what you asked for. You have to um, ensure that the, the data that you're doing, that you're being uh, provided has some sort of um, uh, integrity because the access is only restricted to a few personnel. So let's move on to auditing frameworks. These ones, I'll, I'll just run through them very quick. Um, if you need um, detailed uh, description and details of what exactly these frameworks relate to, there we have the Isaka Kampala chapter. They can be able to um, provide you material on this and, and any of the panelists can be able to help. So we have a COVID, we have the COSOS um, Enterprise Risk Management Framework. We have the ISO 2700,000 series. And each of these um, speak, to, speak to different aspects, yeah? So um, the auditing frameworks have served two basic functions. One, identify good practice and where um, practice needs to improve through a, a systematic approach to IT auditing. They also um, provide senior management with assurance as to quality of our work. So if someone says, okay, um, you've presented all these gaps and all these issues, yeah, how are we sure that this is just not your personal judgment? So there are standard frameworks against which you can perform, um, benchmark your tests and say, okay, you know, according to the, 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 the cost of uh, principles, this is what is expected of IT governance, or this is what is expected of, of, um, of um, the management of IT. So it provides some quality to the work we do. So what COVID um, speaks to and, and what guidance does it provide? So it provides good practice across the domain and process frameworks to um, ensure that activities are presented in a manageable and, and, and logged structure. So it's focused completely on control rather than execution. Yeah, so what are the controls? But it doesn't give you or how to go about uh, executing that control. It, um, then we have ISO 27000 series, which uh, is just a series of best practice to help organization improve um, their information security. Those people who, um, who are probably, uh, who concentrate in the cyber security um, sector use this a lot and also, um, those that are season certified, you, you know this framework. Then we have uh, COSO's Enterprise Risk Management Framework. So it's, as you hear it, for designing, implementing, and evaluate, ev evaluating internal controls for entities providing enterprise risk management. So we'll look at each of these aspects at a very, very, very high level. I'm just going to run through them because time is against us. Um, there are five key features of COSO framework. We have control environment, risk assessment, information and communication, monitoring of activities and existing control activities. Um, you can just use a, a mnemonic called um, or ac acronym CRIME. Um, so what do we do when we're looking at the control environment? Basically what we seek to understand is policies and procedures have been established to provide guidance to the organization. And then what kind of evidence would you need obviously policies and procedures, um, manuals that they have in place, handbooks, how are those policies being established and how are they being implemented? Then we have the risk assessment that um, speaks to whether the organization performs exercises, identification and assessment of risks in order to identify threats that may, they limit uh, achievement of the objectives. You have to look at evidence of a risk register risk assessment reports, communication to the uh, risk committee if there is 
uh, risk uh, committee in place anyway. Information on communication speaks to um, how management uh, communicates both internally and externally, or what do these users expect from them? You can get um, evidence of this where the intranet probably sharing of policies will have some intranet somewhere um, where um, a website somewhere where these uh, policies are uploaded and employees can be able to, um, to obtain those policies. You have websites, you have posters and flyers, especially when you're communicating to the external um, users. Uh, so for monitoring activities, how does management oversee the functioning of the entire organization? And then you have existing control activities. So for the control activities that they already have in place, are they designed and operating effectively? You would have to look at prior period internal audit reports and so on and so on. For ISO, um, I just broke them down into five series, four series that uh, speak to different aspects are interrelated related still because they, they, they set out the information security management system. So um, I don't want to go through it um, um, in detail, but basically ISO 2701 communicates to the implementation, um, contains implementation requirements of an information system, manage, information security management system. Um, so this is the only standard, the only standard against which organizations can be audited and certified. And then we have ISO 2702, which provides overview of information security controls that an organization may choose to implement. Yeah. So it gives a comprehensive view of what on, 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 on how each of those controls work. Then you have um, ISO 27017, ISO 27018. So is uh, speaking to uh, protection of sensitive information in cloud. You hear a lot of cloud computing going on these days. Um, clients just say, oh, we have this system on cloud. No, we, move it, we moved it from on-premise to cloud. Um, so ISO, ISO 27018 is just a little bit different from ISO um, 27, 27017 because it concentrates, it provides extra considerations for personal data. So privacy and, and things like that. Um, we have um, ISO 27701, which covers uh, PIMS, Privacy Information Management Systems. Um, what must one do when implementing PIMS? Um, this one was just recently created in response to uh, GDPR. Okay, we have the COVID framework. Um, this one was uh, developed um, by the IT Governance Institute in conjunction with ISACA. Um, it operates on five basic principles. Um, one is meeting uh, stakeholder needs. Uh, each of those uh, stakeholders, whoever may be, are they needs being met? Does the organization know what they actually need to do to meet these stakeholder needs? And then the second principle is um, does uh, the IT function I mean, the framework is implementing in such a manner that it covers the enterprise end to end. It's just not concentrated on IT alone. And then the third principle speaks to applying a single integrated framework. Yeah. And then the fourth has a, a, a holistic approach so that the concept that systems are being viewed a whole as opposed to inter, in individual um, components, because most times systems communicate to each other. If you go to into a uh, banking environment, you may find that they have 27 plus systems. And at the end of the day, they have to do reporting and there is a financial reporting system where every um, information uh, is being fed to, yeah, for reporting purposes. So in one way or another, they interlink, even, even things to do with just monitoring system, security system that interlinked in a way because they work in the environment as a whole. Now we have, um, Ensure principle five speaks to in, uh, separating governance from management. Yeah, there has to be a clear distinction of um, the governance level and and those who are uh, those who are involved in the day to day operation of um, the business activities. Okay, so what skills do you need for IT auditing? Um, you have to ha you have to be detail oriented. 
I, I talked about professional skepticism a few slides ago. You have to have um, an eye that can spot red flags. You have to have um, risk identification skills, um, problem solving skills, because you will most likely be dealing with large sets of data. Uh, other skills can be project management skills, accounting skills, data analytics, communication skills, very, 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 very important because um, this is where the soft skills now come because you're not going to speak to systems. Eh? You're going to speak to actual humans and you need to know how to, um, to deal with them. And then you also have to have um, a regulatory knowledge um, for IT auditing for the business. Um, so um, you have to, as an auditor, you, IT auditor, you have to strike a delicate balance with the skills in business, in finance and accounting, and in technology. So you usually find that most CISA, uh, CISA um, most people who have been certified in uh, information uh, systems auditing have also done maybe CPA or ACCA. So it, it just gives them that holistic view of how to look at things. Um, so let's go into an icebreaker session. I have talked on and on. So um, we'll have to, we're going to do a, a, a few um, call questions. Uh, just feel free to respond. Rita, are you available? Yes. So that's the first one. If you could get magic powers, which one would you fancy the most? Just make one choice. Make one choice. Um, let's see. I'll choose mind reading. Those people lie a lot. <laughs> um, admit it. Okay. Uh, have we all responded? Let me just see what is in the chat. Have we all responded? We are going to give you two more minutes because we have three uh, poll questions for this icebreaker session. Oh, wow. Mind reading. Uh, if you also don't want, uh, that's, that's, that's a good selection for IT auditors because you don't want people lying to you, yeah? And say they do one thing and they don't do they don't do another so we have 20 percent for time traveling cool you could rewrite your mistakes um invisibility ha huh. these ones i don't trust them <laughs> um edgelessness i think i could also fit into here teleportation as a list okay okay um Nice, nice. I'm impressed that all of us, almost all of us are choosing the coolest things. Um, if you had to retain only one app on your mobile, which one would it be? <laughs> so I know people who have 10 plus apps, there even some that are missing here. Snapchat, whatever, TikTok, there's no TikTok. Uh, they just keep scrolling through. So if I was to have one. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see LinkedIn is not included here, but still I wouldn't have to say LinkedIn. Um, let me see. I'll choose Netflix. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, okay, that's it. I think this will be our last poll because we are really, really out of time. We have to um, run, we have only, we have only 40 minutes left. 
only 40 minutes and we have to cover ITGCs, <laughs> the most important bit. Um, let's see, WhatsApp has the highest rate. Instagram, 3%, Twitter, 15%. Netflix, oh, I call in the 6%. Oh, there, and then there's YouTube. I'm impressed. Very, very much your mindset. Um, okay, okay. Um, so, uh, retail, we're going to proceed um, with our ITGCs because time is against us. And we just want to run through this very, very quickly and because it's the most important aspect. I hope you've all refreshed your minds. I hope you're not bored because um, we're hoping that you pick interest yeah, in this. So let's go to auditing IT general controls. So uh, under this, we'll cover what are ITGCs, um, how are ITGCs important to auditors or hold just not as I, to IT auditors, but to other auditors, um, let's say financial auditors in internal, um, maybe the, the, those people who do uh, risk assessments. Um, then we'll understand the risks arising from the use of IT, the key stages of an ITC review, and then what do ITGCs include? Under this, we'll cover, um, we'll cover all the domains, um, but probably because of time, we'll, we'll have to stop somewhere. So um, ITGCs or IT general controls includes controls over program development, changes to programs and systems and computer operations and access to programs and data. So what this are um, uh, just as you hear the name, general IT controls or IT general controls, controls that you um, expect to uh, have been established in an environment uh, where there is use of IT. Yeah. So audit these are auditable policies and procedures put in place by business to help ensure confidentiality, integrity, availability of its IT systems and data, which we have defined in the previous slides. Um, importance of IT auditors, you see uh, there's a lot going on here. Yeah? So at the minimum level, you have um, sorry, you have things like um, um, access to programs and data, um, significant IT financial applications, the data used in financial applications, and this will uh, be used in financial reporting. Yeah, so whatever um, these IT systems generate, especially the ones being used in the day-to-day -day operations of business, will feed into a specific balance on uh, on what we call the trial balance at the end of the year, which is what usually financial um, auditors do. Yeah, so those balances are generated by these IT systems. So you have um, to pay close attention, you as an um, IT auditor, to what this. Uh, systems actually do? Do they do it efficiently? Do, do they do it the right way? Are they doing it consistently? So um, if we understand the risks uh, from the use of IT, you have IT environment down here that is linked to the entire business um, operations, and then there is um, feeding into financial reporting. So the risks that would have to do with reports are inaccurate or incomplete because uh, some systems, some ways just doing the wrong thing. And then there's human error in operating the systems. There is some level of fraud by uh, management bypassing the controls that are already there. There is software failure. There is data corruption because you're not backing up your data. Um, there is management override of these controls because you've not appropriately restricted the controls. Um, so what are the key stages of an ITCC review? As mentioned earlier, I understand the control environment, yeah? what controls have been implemented and to address which risks. Then understand the systems um, around which these controls have been implemented. Then after that, evaluate and test the IT general controls, evaluate IT, ITGC deficiencies, and then perform your reporting. So under understanding the control environment, gather information about the control environment, including systems and controls. This just uh, goes on to say that we perform ITGC work when there are systems doing calculations, that there are reports, the automated controls, there is um, restricted access and, and security to, to the systems, the interfaces, systems are communicating with each other through a certain interface. Um, then you evaluate and test these ITGCs. 
um, assess the design and operating effectiveness. And, um, and this is where most of the bulk of the work comes in. Then after that, you do um, evaluate those ITGC's deficiencies, yeah? So what are the gaps that you have noticed? What, um, what is amiss, yeah? What risks are staring at you in the face? What risks are trying to be addressed, but they're not being addressed, yeah? So you can structure your deficiencies around the risks that those gaps present, yeah? Because management would definitely want to look at, okay, so uh, um, my manager usually says, okay, so passwords are not working. How does that change the price of my token in the market? Yeah, so what, what is the, the underlying factor behind that? If the systems are not operating, um, if the controls are not operating effectively, what does that mean for the business then? Yeah, so um, relay the, 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 first of all, the fact, the, the, the risk that is presented by, by those gaps, the effect of crystallization of those risks, and then um, perform suitable, um, maybe you give suitable recommendations to address um, those gaps. Then you perform a, a, a report, you document a report, probably communicating this, um, like I said, the facts, the root cause, um, the risks, the effect and recommendations, and then maybe you obtain response from management and a re remediation plan. Say, okay, maybe by June we'll have these things affected. Um, so what do ITGCs include? You have had ITGCs, ITGCs, ITGCs. Um, they come in four domains. We have user access management, we have IT change management, we have backup um, management and recovery and system implementation. So everything that's called ITGCs falls under these four domains, yeah? They find a place to fall. Um, Let's start with uh, user access management. Under this, you have thing you're dealing with things like how is access granted, how is access uh, revoked for ten uh, for levers, um, what kind of uh, password administration um, process is there? Do they periodically review the access of users to 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 assess the appropriateness on a timely basis um, on an ongoing basis? Um, then there is privileged user activity monitoring. So everything that you see on, on the boxes on the right feeds actually to privileged user um, monitoring. These are users that have elevated or administrative rights. Yeah, They go above and beyond the normal, what you and I have. So usually they say, um, I've been locked out of my system. Someone says, contact IT, contact IT, because they have rights that you do not have. There is something that they have that you do not have that prompts you to go to them. So that is what we're looking at. By the virtue of the fact that they have those elevated rights, are their activities being monitored? Because it presents a higher risk than uh, the, the rights that are being um, assigned to normal users. Okay, so the key risks that are presented include um, unauthorized access to systems by business users, unauthorized access to systems and data by IT users. So um, these are some of the controls that you would expect to find under the domain user access management, um, that access to application database operating systems are being reviewed and authorized by management. So when you're looking at a system, let me mention um, a common system. A common system, uh, let's say uh, Finaco. Most of us know Finaco. Um, so uh, Finaco, you as a normal person will just know Finaco, but Finaco uh, has a database, yeah? It has a supporting, it has supporting infrastructure. To have a database, the database um, will probably have an operating system that it sits on, and then the application will also have an operating system. So we look at these things at a holistic level. Look at the system, assess the database, look at the operating system, yeah? That is what they call the, um, supporting infrastructure. Then you also have things like passwords to database, um, um, applications, and also um, operating systems are set in an effective manner. You have um, terminated uh, application database and operating server users access is removed on a timely basis, something I've been seeing in the entire time. Activities of privileged users are regularly monitored for appropriateness, yeah? So there are considerations under each of these, but uh, we'll delve into this as we go. 
So this is what um, this is what um, application security will look like. So you have the application, and then you have it will have a database, it will have an operating system, there's an internal network, there's a perimeter network, there's physical security, then there is business user access, uh, access management, then you have the technical users, which we call the IT users. Yeah. So at application security level, you want to say, you want to ensure that, um, that only authorized users have access to application systems and also users access levels within applications are appropriate and do not contravene segregation of duty rules. Privileges accounts within applications are controlled. So you, for example, I just want to give you an, a, a brief example of a control that you'd um, find under uh, application security. So these are the objectives, but things like um, only um, authorized users are given access to um, a system. You do not want uh, you do not want an unknown user to have access to your system. First of all, because it holds it it holds important data. Yeah. So you only want authorized users, and a control that you would put in place would be like passwords. Yeah. So your passwords should be strong. Your password should be um, uh, your password should be meet a complexity level. And maybe if I can just go back one slide and go through this. So when you're looking at passwords, you want to ensure, you want to ask question whether is it administered at user level or, or at system level. So um, a system level would probably be, give you more comfort because once the configurations are set at a central level, everyone has to adhere by it. So you say, okay, the maximum length of passwords has to be eight. It's no exception to Christine, no exception to Rita, no exception. So everyone has to abide by it if it's established at central level. That, and then you also have to consider that user IDs are unique. Um, password parameters are in best with a best practice. You look at parameters like what's the minimum length of a password, what should be the, the maximum edge of a password, not probably something like not more than 30 days. You have the password history. How many times can you repeat? Um, after how many pass change, password changes can you repeat your password? And then you have lookout thresholds. This is usually for how many times can you um, uh, unsuccessfully log in because before you are thrown out, before you're locked out of the account. Then things like complex complexity have one um, maybe. Uh, one hour, you have one alphabet requirement for one minimum alphabet, uh, an alphanumeric, a sign, a number, a symbol, and all, all these combinations, yeah? Then um, allow me just to run through the privileges of access when you, when you, because this is very, very important. Most times when you hear a fraud has happened, someone has probably um, exploited the privileged um, rights that have been given to them. So like I said, privileged users are usually um, IT, users, IT, IT users. They have access that is up and beyond what everyone has, yeah? So you want to assess things like, um, have powerful IDs been considered for monitoring? How, um, how does management actually monitor these powerful accounts? Do they have a tool that logs these, 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 um, the user's um, activities? Are those logs actually reviewed because it's one thing to log um, the activity and then it just sits there. You don't know what is happening. Then it's another thing to actually generate those logs and go through them and say, okay, this is appropriate. This seems out of the ordinary. Let me follow up on it. Then um, how are those reviews performed? Yeah, What is the timeliness of the review? Because someone can go and delete those logs. Yeah, And then are generic IDs being considered for the review? Generic IDs uh, usually exist when uh, um, more than one user has access to, to, to one account, yeah? So you find Christine and maybe Kefa have access to a certain account called DBA. And they all know the password and they are not using um, unique IDs. So you don't know who logged in, whether it's Christine or Kefa. You don't know uh, if someone performed, deleted a table, changed the table, you can't trace it. To whether it's Christine or it's Kefa. So consider that. Um, I already spoke about terminate, uh, terminated application and, and database and operating system users. 
what is the mechanism used to notify what are the access removal time frames? Uh, is access actually removed in a timely, timely manner? Um, for access request to be uh, to, to application, this would just mean that before someone gives you access to maybe their system, let's say SAP, um, you've gone through the approval process and they've vended you, um, vended you as an employee. So what policies are in place to ensure that um, only authorized people have access to the system, um, that the request is uh, that they fill in is valid, is for a valid employee, it's just not someone somewhere. Um, uh, who are these approvers? Are they appropriate? You don't want someone who runs the printer to approve, probably you want someone uh, who is the head of a department. And then does the access commensurate with job responsibilities? So, um, someone is probably, um, a financial accountant and has been granted access to create and delete users in the system. This is what causes problems. Um, and then access is granted, uh, access that has been granted is that what has been, is that which has been requested in that when I request access to, when my access has been approved to just reconcile reports, someone now doesn't go and give me access to also uh, look at sensitive files or generate or make changes to sensitive files yeah so that is what they mean so if i come back to application security here we're like i said we're looking at objectives of those controls so we are ensuring that only authorized have users have access to those applications so if you keep these objectives in mind you will be able to pick out those gaps you'll be able to know which controls are designed and operating effectively so um, privileged accounts within the application are controlled. We already spoke about uh, use of privileged accounts. Then um, how do we manage application security? So I've highlighted it in yellow, authentication and login. So some, some people use two-factor authentication where you use a password, then it generates a code that's sent to your mobile you use that code to now enter the financial reporting application. Yeah, so a, an application will encompass, um, will use, will do a lot of process processes. For example, if I give you um, maybe SAP, SAP has the performance levels are just out of this world. It will do a lot of things. Yeah, so you want to ensure that only authorized people have access to your system. Um, so access controls provide fine grain access and SOD. So companies need to know who has access to do what and to ensure that someone isn't given inappropriate privileges, yeah? So this is very, very fu fundamental because if you're given inappropriate privileges, someone will deliberately go and commit something for their own benefit, yeah? Um, so you have, you can uh, implement preventive or detective controls. So you have to design com compliant roles, yeah? Then provide compliant user provisioning, like I said, ensure that there is some sort of approval by appropriate personnel before these users are give, uh, given access to the system, just to ensure that you, the, the people who are being given access are actually employees of the business. Um, enforce compensating controls when access cannot be avoided, yeah? Um, finite and control provisioning for contractor, and consultant access. So these people are special. They usually just come once in a while and they would need access to your system. For example, external auditors, they'll come and say, okay, I need access to SAP. Uh, give me access to um, these T codes. So what is what process does the business have in place to ensure that only, um, only um, approved consultants have access to the system and after they are used, it's timely deactivate those accounts are logged because someone can come and use it for something else, completely different. Uh, so you have detective controls, so you can do reviews or analyze user roles and responsibilities for SOD violations, identify and remediate SOD violations, monitor user and um, function, function activity. So ensure that you generate those logs. If you have a logging system, ensure that you have a logging system and then um, those logs are generated and reviewed by an appropriate personnel. And the people that 
are being reviewed do not also have access to the logs because someone can actually go and delete those logs. So you don't, you can't trace what they did. Yeah. So it's it's very fundamental. If we move on to um, data security, we have the database. Yeah. So these people, as if you can see, applic um, business users can access the system through the application. This uh, the database staff have access to the database which hosts the financial data. And so their risk increases because they can make direct changes. They don't have to go through a login and login. They can make direct changes to the, um, the data, the financial data. And this data may be significant. So database security relates to security over databases, uh, data files and data sets, controls around direct access using special system utilities, yeah? Um, so it does not refer to security of access to data from within an application. Like I said, someone doesn't access data like a normal business user. They run probably a query and just bam, they've entered. Yeah. Um, so um, what are the financial risks related to this? Highly, highly, the direct changes that um, can be made to the transaction and records. And as a layman, you'd never know. You'd never know because someone used back-end access. Um, how can this be controlled? In, ensure that access um, requests to database files are properly reviewed and authorized by management, yeah? Um, terminated users are removed on a timely, timely basis. Someone will be living in a, in a couple of months and because they're, they're administering maybe uh, at end of day processes, they'll run a query and say, okay, every day I'll just, um, I'll run this query at end of day when they're doing backup and it will just pick 100 shillings for everyone's from everyone's account. You know, when I look at my bank statement, I see 100 shillings and bid has been uh, debited. I'll not investigate, but imagine the impact of that for a total population for users in the bank. Yeah, so ensure that terminated users um, are removed in a timely basis. Super user access, like I said, um, are periodically monitored for appropriateness. Passwords to database and data files are utilized in an effective manner. So some of the databases that you may have heard of include SQL in all its glory. There is Oracle, there is IBM DB2, which is more rare than, than the rest. Um, so what are the key uh, database controls for your consideration? You ensure that uh, privileges accounts um, such as root use and generic IDs are logged for auditing purposes. Key financial data is backed up and can be recovered completely. Um, dormant users and inactive users are monitored. Um, authentication event logs are generated, secured and independently reviewed. Uh, we've talked about passwords, we've talked about uh, access to sensitive files. Um, and then we, there are things such as um, um, security patches, and then also um, unnecessary, um, sorry, okay. Protocols and system components are disabled and removed to, to limit potential vulnerabilities. So moving on to the operating system, the same controls that you apply for um, a database uh, would be the same controls that would be applied for an operating system for an effective end-to-end um, -end risk um, addressing the risks. So um, you as an auditor will just have to assess the operating effectiveness of those controls, yeah? So I'll just skip over the operating system security. Like I said, it most possibly presents the same risks as the, the, the risks um, presented under database security because these users are also considered to be very, very, very um, privileged users, what we call super users or administrative users, they can do what none of us can do. Yeah. So um, it's key that you keep them in mind. Some of the operating systems we know have, we have Windows, um, there are versions of this. You have Unix or Linux, there are also versions to it. There is OS 400. So, um, so for, for each, if you want to know how to audit each of these, there are people who are equipped with, um, with um, auditing for each of these systems and, and operating systems and databases. We don't have the time to delve into it in depth, 
So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that just to pique your interest in case you're more um, interested in, in learning more, you can always um, reach out to ISACA. I think they have materials and audit programs for that. Yeah. So we have a case study. Um, let's check the time. Okay. Um, so um, for, the, for this case study, we'll just apply what you have learned. Yeah. And so a, a set of call questions again will be launched to just get your views whether you've understood. So the board, the board of directors for Bank XYZ two years ago approved a significant amount of money for management to procure tools and technology to support with privileged access management. Pam. This, this was following an incident that occurred where the database administrator of the bank successfully ran programs from the back end at the end of the day to increase his account balance. The example of what, what I mentioned. The estimated loss to the bank arising from the fraud was $2 million. The board of directors recently requested the internal audit team to provide assurance that the investment made in the tools and the technology have eliminated the risk and the exposure. As the IT auditor of the bank, you are saddled with the responsibility of developing and executing an audit plan and procedures to establish that the current situation and, the, and, and, and report on any residu residual risks arising from the control gaps and deficiencies, yeah. So you've read that. Um, we've seen that someone inappropriately used their privileged access and committed a fraud probably read a query, like I said, at the end of the day, and picked 100 from all of our accounts and just debited, I mean, created his account. And first, we are not bothered, but the bank knows what's now going on. And now they have, they have a privileged access monitoring system. Then you as an ID audit has been called upon by the board of directors. And they have told you to, um, to communicate um, whether the control is operating effectively, are there any control gaps, are there any deficiencies, and then what are the residual risks related? So um, if you can just launch the poll questions. Bennett, if you're there. Not. Okay, so question four, you've made, okay. So you've made some notes following your initial reviews. Which of the following would you consider to be a higher risk? So here you're performing a risk assessment of sorts. So one, the new DB administrator has access to the logs generated and fed into the palm tool. Yeah. Then the palm tool has rules, rules set up but does not generate alerts for anomalies. The palm tool has no means of generate an alert if the logs fail. Yeah. Um, the risk department responsible for reviewing the logs have admin rights on the DB. Okay. So they're asking you um, which of the following would you? consider to be a higher risk from all my rap that I've been going on about, which one would you consider a higher risk? Here you see that the new DB administrator has access to the logs generated and fed into the pump, the pump tool. Then there's another one where the rule set, the rules have been set up, but does not generate alerts for anomaly. So if everything is just being, you get. Um, then the other is, the tool has no means of even generate, generating an alert if the logs fail. So the, everything is being, you will think everything is being logged, but, but you, oh, the log will fail and you have no way of, no, of knowing. Um, the risk department who is also re responsible for reviewing the logs have admin rights on the DP. So by admin rights, they mean the privileged access rights. So if you can just, just pick a single choice and, and send. Oh, we have 10 minutes. Uh, 
and we were planning to cover um, Oh, wow. Let's see. Okay, the DB um, administrator has access to the logs um, generated. Wow, and pressed. And then also the risk department responsible for reviewing the logs have admin rights. These are probably the highest, the highest risks, yeah? Because someone can just go and now, if, if the person can, uh, if you're reviewing what you have done, <laughs> like, I mean, if you have admin rights and you can actually, you have the option of changing, you have the option of, okay. It's, it's basically a saying, set a thief to catch a, catch a thief because you have access to the system that logs and you also have admin rights. That means you are reviewing yourself. Yeah, you're reviewing what you've done. Yeah. So you are part of that. So the risk department is actually part of the problem. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. So if we're addressing the problem, the risk department already has access to privileged, um, has a, a super user rights. Yeah. So, but they have also been tasked with the responsibility to review those logs. How effective do you think it can be? Very, very ineffective. Someone will just come, ah, we're part of this or they themselves may actually be the problem. So that's, I think, the top, top risk. And then there's also, yes, the DB administrator has access to the logs generated and fed into the pump tool, yeah? So if, if they, they may have access, yeah, but maybe they don't have access to delete, they can also only view, yeah, maybe. But that also presents a very, very high risk. And then the rest of them are also risks, but not at the rate not the not as high as this this risk department person um the next please next okay after you independently review the logs in the palm tool you noted some unusual activities which were not followed up or on by the risk department. What would be the nature of this issue? You also have a single choice here. Um, one, the design of the control is ineffective. The operation of the control is ineffective. They also have the option to say you're not sure, but I'm hoping that we're not saying we're not sure, but it's also okay not to be sure because we can now address, we can address it here and say, okay, you see this is the right thing to do. So the, the issue here is that unusual activity is not being followed up by the risk department. So what would be the nature of this issue? Is it the fact that the design of the control is ineffective or the operation of the control is ineffective? Or are you not sure what is going on? So you don't know what's going on. Things are just a mix. Have we selected? Ah, okay. So again, uh, let's say the operation of the control is ineffective. Then we have 3% that say, I'm not sure. And then we have my people here that say the design of the control is ineffective. So the issue here is actually that the design of the control is ineffective. Yeah, because we already mentioned in poll question five that this risk management people have privileged access um, privileged rights to the system. They can delete people, they can make changes, they can um, delete tables, append tables, um, set up new users. So if they do not follow up, um, if the process, if the control is also designed in a way that it's the risk department to follow up on those unusual activities, do you think they can do it? Because they're already part of the problem. So the, design, the, the control is there, but it's designed poorly. 
Yeah, so it's not addressing the risk at all. So it's, it's in fact even increasing the risk because if you are just had, having a few uh, database people, maybe they're like two, now you've added on two risk people who have also privileged rights. So there are now four. So you just increase your problem. Yeah, yet you probably spent money in the, the board that spent money in implementing this PAM tool. They want some kind of comfort that, you know, there is value for their money. But this, it's like drinking water using a fork. Control is there, it's not designed. Um, okay, I hope those who chose, I am not sure, are now sure, hopefully, hopefully. Yes, you can just launch the next. Next, okay. Given the issues you've noted so far, what would you consider the residual risk associated with privileged access to be? So you are being tasked to rate these risks, the risk, yeah? Is the risk low? Yeah, is it low is ignorable. Low is there, you may need to address it. Yeah, you will need to address it, but you know, it's not, it's probably just peeping at you in the corner. Then medium could be like, it's there, needs to be brought to someone's attention, but it may not require maybe prompt, prompt action, yeah? High would be something that, you know, um, that the risk is now staring at you in the face, yeah? The risk is staring, it has, come, it has come to confront you face to face. Significant would be the risk has slapped you in the face, like it's that high, yeah? Significant is just a lot. You need to action on it. That's significant. So what would you consider? the risk to be? What's the residual risk after implementation of this control? Oh, three minutes. Okay. I'm sure most of us have answered. Ah, significant and high. That's nice, that's nice, yes. So, um, I, I don't want to say, yeah, it, there's some level of subjectivity, but I'm, I'm glad that we've chosen significant and high. Yes, the risk is staring at you in the face and it has slapped you in the face. That's, that's significant, yeah? So your problems have just increased. That's practically what has happened. Um, let's, let's go on and launch the next. Okay, given the issues that you have uh, presented to the board of directors, what do you think will be the board's first request? Yeah, so now you've come and told them, you know, this is what is happening, the risk, the risk department, who is also tasked with um, reviewing the activities of these users, has privileged access to this uh, system and they're actually not even doing any follow-ups. They're not doing any kind of objectivity whatsoever. Uh, they're not doing the work, yeah? And based on this, you, you assess the risk to be very, very significant. You assess the risk to be very, very high. And then, so what do you think the board's um, first request will be? So request here will be, um, First choice is immediately retire the control owners. And then you have a choice to request to know if there has been any fraud arising due to the gap deficiencies. Then you have request management to engage an external consultant for assistance. And then you have request to know if the palm tool needs to be changed. So um, this last option is asking if the palm tool is actually the problem. This other option, the third option is, um, is, is asking if there is need for an external consultant to assist with this. Um, this one is, is, is asking um, what kind of fraud has, has, um, is arising from these gaps noted or these significant deficiencies that you've rated significant. 
percent uh -huh. impressed. If I can clap for you, <laughs> yes, impressed. Um, yes, yes. So that's definitely what they would want to know. Is there any fraud arising from the failure of this control? So you, as an IT auditor, when you're presenting your reports, ensure that you communicate the effect of the crystallization of those risks if they have crystallized. What I mean is, okay, so now maybe um, the, risk, the risk department is not doing what they need to do. Um, you have all those problems that we noted at poll question seven, but out of that, did anyone take advantage of all those risks that were staring at you in the face and slapping you in the face? Did someone take advantage to perform inappropriate activity because their concern is previously someone used that. Yeah, and they went away with $2 million, enough to live on for a lifetime, I think, if you're being conservative. But um, so yes, they would want to know, you would have to perform assessments to determine, yeah, what is the effect, yeah, of that risk? What is, what is the response? What, what's coming out of it? Do they take advantage of that weakness? You will always have to um, do that for any risk. If the livers are not being terminated, um, you have to perform assessments to say, okay, so all these livers were not terminated during this period. Um, all these people left during this period due to the deficiencies that I have noted. Is it possible that someone exploited yeah, those gaps? To, to take advantage of, of the weakness or something and what is the effect, yeah? So once maybe probably the board directors get to know that, oh, there's no fraud, um, then they'll have to consider um, other options, um, probably uh, redesign the control by engaging an external consultant um, and, and, and other things. So um, I think it's 8 p.m. now. Uh, this session was supposed to run for two hours. And um, we were supposed to tackle uh, change management today, but because we are against time, I'll let our, our hosts advise us on what we can do, whether we can continue tomorrow or something. So um, Ben or Kefa, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christine. You've done wonderful work. Um, since we have uh, one more chapter for today, no subsection to go, I would suggest maybe you com you you complete up in the, um, the fastest time possible. Since we started a little bit, ten minutes in two six p.m. So let's give you another more 10 minutes so that you complete up. You're muted. Uh, Christine, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, sorry well, about that. Um, so change management is very, very, very critical. I was hoping that we'll get enough time for it, but if we are not, um, I think this material will be uh, written by Isaka and um, you can always um, reach out to them um, in case you need to. So there's some glitch. Okay. Okay. Ah, so let's move on to change management and the change management. The key risks that are presented by, um, by changes to a system will be unauthorized direct changes to an application or changes that introduce errors in the application. So um, uh, examples would be uh, specific. Um, so the breakdown of what change management is will be um, authorization, there's testing, there's segregation of environment, there's implementation of the change, there's documentation and training to ensure that the users know um, how to make uh, use of the system after the change has been implemented. There is segregation of duties during the change implementation to see that whoever requested the change is not the one testing it, it's not, he's not the one developing it, he's not the one running it on the production environment. 
then you have the monitoring of the changes on a periodic basis to ensure that um, only appropriate changes, only approved changes are being made um, to the system. So um, there is, there is um, confusion when it comes to a configuration change and a coded change, yeah? So configuration change would be best explained by this example. If you notice the before image, there's a switch, there is a car, there's a door, there, there are walls, there is a bulb. Now, after the configuration change, this is what you'll have. There is a switch, there is a door, there is a car, there is everything is the same. What has changed? Just the color. So that is what the configuration change is. It just changes the outlook. No underlying factors are, are done. And most times you don't even need the vendor for a configuration change. You can just do it. It's just surface management of the interface, yeah? So it's just a, a surface change. Um, then a coded change will be, so before the, you see there, there is no bulb, there is no switch. After a coded change now, the bulb has been introduced, the color of the car has changed. Um, there is now a, 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 a switch and a bulb. Um, so for, for most times for a coded change, you need how to reach out to a vendor because most especially if, if the, the system is not in-house. So uh, code, uh, code change involves making changes to underlying, um, underlying um, aspects of a system, yeah? So um, the codes are usually uh, retained by um, the vendors. And um, once you need to make significant changes, you will then contact the vendor and they'll come and make for you those changes. So that's the difference between a, a configuration change and a coded change. Um, this also speaks to that, I'll just skip it. Um, a risk-based approach for change control. What are the key risks that um, changes present? So uh, like I said, there is unauthorized changes by application code and, and, and um, the changes that have been in, uh, intro, um, approved, but they introduce errors in the system. So there's a risk of direct changes being made to the application by those privileged users that we, we saw earlier on. Then there is a failure to make changes to reflect a regulatory or accounting policy. You say, oh, we've changed, um, uh, maybe now we've changed aspects of IFRS 9. We need you to, um, so if you were initially um, uh, doing that by using a system, uh, it posts, it, it does evaluation and does that. Now you need to make change to the system, yeah, to reflect the regulatory change. So um, there are some examples being given here. Um, for this, it's only approved changes, examples of controls that you will find in a, a change environment for change management. Only approved changes to application controls um, are made, yeah? So when you're doing migration, you ensure that management has approved by appropriate personnel. The changes have been approved. Um, the changes that have been uh, processed to application and programs are periodically monitored for appropriateness. Uh, the changes um, are adequately tested before they're they're migrated to the production environment. Then you also have things like segregation of duties. The tester, the developer, the tester, and the implementer are two different people plus the requester. The, the, I mean the four. Oh, okay, the four, just ensure that the four I principle has been implemented. So. Um, IT change management, what does it consist of these? You, in a typical environment, you'll find that um, uh, the controls have been implemented in this manner. There will be a change request. Then the, once the change request has been approved, the change will be developed. Um, once the change has been developed, they'll test it on the test environment. Um, and now once they test it on the test environment, they now implement it on the live, uh, um, on the live or production environment. So you ensure, like I said, segregation of duties across all this. And then you ensure that there is ongoing monitoring and maintenance of those changes. Okay, so activities under each change request, user initiates a change request. This is an ideal um, change management control. The user initiates a change request, the business um, or the IT, the, the um, department leader approves it, then there's some prioritization, there's maybe they specify aspects of it, what exactly needs to be done. Then 
the developer makes a change on the development uh, environment, then there's testing, then um, from then the changes migrated from the developer and test to a test environment by one personnel. Then they perform maybe integration testing to see that um, all this, um, um, all the change is, um, is integrated uh, successfully within the application. Then you have um, UAT changes. These are user acceptance um, tests. So usually when you make a change, um, people just people just say, ah, oh, we prefer the way the system works, worked before. So you want to ensure that the business users are comfortable um, using the new change. So you may probably have to uh, call on one or two business users, okay, test this aspect. Um, and then once they say, ah, oh, it's actually good, we're comfortable with it, you can proceed with the implementation. And the implementation, of course, now you first have to review the test scripts and the test results, review the impact um, once you have uh, implemented um, on the test and then the test, um, the user acceptance testing has been done and then migrate the change to production then you can perform ongoing um, monitoring and maintenance. Okay, so I've already spoken to this, the change request process. Sometimes um, the banks I know that um, have this entire process automated, yeah. Um, and there are also, um, you see, you find other businesses where this is done uh, on paper, but nevertheless, it's done really well, yeah. So this is very, very, very high because um, everything feeds to a change. If someone has unauthorized access, what can they do with it? They can make an unauthorized change, yeah? If some even has, someone has privileges of access, what can they do with it? They can make an unauthorized change. So these changes are key, key, key. If, if the controls around changes um, um, are failing, they will probably be rated um, the residual risk will probably be at a high, yeah? Because of the underlying factors or the impact of what this means if, if the controls fail or if the controls are not even existent at all. Um, so there are some changes that do not, um, that you'll find that didn't have a business approval, will have infrastructure changes and emergency changes. So I'll concentrate on emergency changes. So probably um, there is someone has identified an incident and say um, uh, suddenly a certain fun functionality of the, um, of the system is not operating well. We can no longer log on onto our, syst our FINACO systems. Then that will probably call upon um, uh, an emergency change. Yeah, They need to do the change then, then because it's probably a core banking system and everything has now come to a standstill. So they may not go through the conventional process, yeah, that I've just described before. They may have um, um, other procedures that are addressed, but the important thing is that they should have procedures around emergency changes because it may just be quick then and then, yeah? So you'll find that emergency changes are often sent out by vendors, of applications when a bug is found, yeah? So you procured an application and all of a sudden, there's a, they're calling it, it's a mess. So now they have to make an emergency change. Um, they, they, they need to be implemented quickly um, to keep the system running. They may not have time to go through that entire long control that I've just described that should be in place. Um, however, this is key, key, key. Those controls should be retrospectively applied. What I mean by ret retrospectively is after everything has been done and said, go back and try to implement that control. Make a request. Ensure that the change is tested. Ensure that um, uh, there's um, segregation of duties. There's approval for these tests. There is um, the, the change being um, implemented into the into the production has been approved. There is user acceptance testing. So apply it retrospectively after everything has been done. But one thing you should also keep in mind um, for uh, 
for change management is um, when you're auditing change management is how to determine the population of those changes so to ensure that you've captured every change um, in your population. And uh, most times that uh, um, businesses may not have tools that automatically log in. They may have um, uh, paper files to keep track of these changes. So all you need to do is to ensure that maybe there's some system for accountability to ascertain the completeness of the changes to say maybe those paper files are labeled in a sequential um, manner. It's running from A to, to, to Z or to from one to a certain number and the sequences are um, applied. So have some comfort because once you've determined your po population is complete, then you have some comfort that you're not missing out on anything because your sample will represent your population. But if your population is wrong to start with, now your detection risk increases even higher than it was already um, before. Another thing about change management is segregation of environments. Ensure that the environment for development, for test, and for um, for implementation or, or, or production live is they're segregated. They are not the same environments. Yeah. Um, so here they're going through uh, again details of what the, the the developer does. I'll just run through this um, because um, we've previously previously spoken about this. Then there's testing and quality assurance. This is where all the testing comes. There's development and environment unit and system testing. You have to perform um, integration system and stress uh, testing, then use acceptance, test, uh, acceptance testing. Then you have in the production environment, there's no testing unless there's a direct change. Yeah, so if you're making direct changes, probably an emergency change that is where uh, testing in the live um, environment could come. So, so what do each of these testings uh, seek to um, answer? Unit testing, does the change program work on its own? Yeah. System testing, does the change program work within the system? Integration testing, does the change work with other application reports or data? Usually, um, initially, if it was having reconciliations, if it was uh, appending reports, is it able to perform those functions even after the change has been implemented? There is user acceptance testing. Does the change meet the user requirements? Yeah. Then regression testing, did additional errors arise from fixing other problems? Then stress testing, does it operate reliably for a significant number of transactions as you hear the word stress? Yeah. So you want to see the maximum limit. Um, under which the change um, or the new functionality can operate. So implementation, we already went through each of these. I'll just skip through it. Then ongoing monitoring and maintenance. So most of the environments I've encountered actually for a look this control, yet it's very, very, very key. Ensure that changes are uh, on a on a periodic basis here. Yeah? Um, they are monitored for appropriateness here yeah? to ensure um, that only approved changes were, were made. Yeah? So you as an auditor, what you will do when, you, um, when you're auditing changes is you will now pick, um, once you determine your population, you picked a sample, you will now trace the change backwards. Yeah, through the process, they'll probably have a policy that encompasses every um, aspect I've described here. What you now do is walk through the change. You pick maybe if there's an automated tool, you got your um, your 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 sample from there. You then walk through and say, okay, was the request being made? Um, was there some testing done? Uh, did them were the environment segregated? Were the people segregated? Were approvals of of test um, test cases and test scripts done? What um, did the users confirm that this test, uh, this uh, change actually meets their needs? Um, did this change um, generate any errors after what were the actions taken uh, and so on? Another key thing is you need to determine whether you can, um, there's a fallback. So in case you launch the change and things just go haywire. <laughs> so that's why it's just, testing is actually important. You want to ensure that 
Um, because testing test environment is usually a replica of the live environment. You want to see, just test that this change when you introduce it to the live, it will not make um everyone run mad. It will not change everything, it will not cause a, a lot of errors. So you need to have uh, businesses need to have in place um procedures that allow them fall back to the position they were at and say, okay, ah, you know what, we made a mistake. Let's go back to the way things are. Yeah. So that you just you're not just stuck with your mistake and it's then that done. That like the damage has been done and cannot be undone. So um let me just go again through what you'll need to do for IT change management. And maybe we can close here because I see we've already um we've already run. Um so what you need to do, one, identify the population of the implemented changes from the production environment, if feasible. Like I say, most, most people not have a tool that logs changes. So you need to determine other ways of assessing completeness of that population of the change. Um, if it's not feasible, identify population of scheduled and emergency changes yeah? separately as processes and, and controls are mostly different. Yeah. Then determine the sample size. Remember, your sample size has to reflect your actual population. Incorporate risk and professional judgment when you're picking these risks because this is a very, very high risk area. And then ensure changes are pro appropriately authorized and tested prior to implementation. So you'll probably review for evidence of uh, signatures from appropriate personnel. Um, maybe they have their name signed, the date signed, um, and everything has been stored and maintained in a file somewhere, or it could be um, a soft copy evidence. Um, consider whether the impact of the change on internal controls has been reviewed, yeah? So they probably made a change to, to um, aspects of a report before it was not um, maybe calculating VAT. Now it's calculating VAT. So if there were reconciliations being done on that report, has it affected those reconciliations? Yeah, and then um, for emergency changes, ensure retrospective approval and testing was performed. So at that time, business might have uh, wanted to just, you know, let's run this because we're time tight. We need this thing to work. We need to keep the business operating and running. But after everything has calmed down, did they um, perform what was needed in the first place? And then ensure separate environments are maintained and changes follow a predefined route. Yeah. So like I said, from development to test to live or production. And usually they're, they're separate people who, um, um, who perform these roles, yeah? The migration for the changes through the different environments. Uh, determine whether periodic re reviews are performed to reconcile implemented changes to the schedule of changes, yeah? So you... Prof um, you generate, uh, you perform, a, you get a system generated list of changes. Say, okay, so uh, the system is finical. Let's run um, a report that will generate um, all the changes that have been implemented on the system vis a vis the schedule of changes that you probably maintain somewhere and reconcile them. If you pick changes that have been implemented on the system without actually being logged on your schedule of changes. That means it may have been unauthorized because they, uh, they could have been reviewed um, for um, those changes. So management needs to have visibility of the changes that are being made to the system. How do they do this? Yeah, by monitoring those changes that are being made to a system. Yeah, to ensure that the changes that have been, if I just go, went into a system and say, ah, today the system looks different, that we incorporated tax, aspects, I should be able to go into a log of changes, pick that change and trace it through the entity's change management system and say, okay, they actually did what was needed. You understand? Okay. Um, I don't want to go to the quiz because um, I wanted to just take 20 minutes for this because it's an important aspect. Um, allow me to close here. I will invite um, um, Kefa um, after this.
but I just uh, wanted to say that we'll have another session tomorrow. And if you have had any questions, I see the Q&A has been cleared. If you have any questions, we'll probably have some seven more minutes. The panel is available to take um, any questions. So um, we'll probably just answer the, the very, very burning questions, not to say all questions are not burning, but uh, because of the time aspect, we've already taken 30 minutes of the time. And so we just want to um, ensure that only the key, the key, key, key questions are addressed and probably others will be addressed in, the, in tomorrow's um, session. So Kefa, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much, um, Christine. Uh, it has been a wonderful session. And uh, from this side, I would just do this. <laughs> um, this has been uh, an enriching session in that um, a lot of things has been said, practical aspects on how to audit IT systems. I feel um, I've gained a Dot, and I hope our, our attendees do share the same the same message. Okay, that uh, you you are not uh, going away the way you came in. Okay, this has just been day one of the two days, so I will be back here tomorrow and continue up with all all other aspects that um, will be up for tomorrow. We hope to have you here, um, wherever you are. So um, I do humbly request that you schedule your time as usual will be beginning at 6 p.m. East, East African time. And uh, the session will take two hours up to eight. Okay. Uh, for those who had most of the questions, uh, many have been answered as the session was going on. Um, but in case you have any now, you could um, post them, and then we'll be able to to answer them. On the panel, we've been um, uh, we've had Mr. Uh, Mr. Bernard Wanyama, who is uh, the CEO of Syntec as so as associates, he is a Caesar, a CISM, a CJ, and C risk, and has vast experiences from all other other areas of IT management, IT audits, information security assurances, and others. Uh, we've also had Mr. Peter Ojakunel, who who is a senior. Senior, senior manager, risk assurance at PWC has been on the on the panel also to answer the questions. Okay, allow me uh, give a minute or two to Mr. Peter or Jacunel from from PWC. Uh, to give a few of his remarks. Mr. Peter, over to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Kefa. And um, um, again, thank you very much for the opportunity. And a big thank you to, to Christine for a very good presentation um, and apologies for extending beyond the time. Um, but I really hope that um, with the little that has been shared, you've been able to take one or two things out of this um, session. Of course, this is really high level, really abridged, um, but I want to believe that it's a very good base or foundation for you um, to start from. Um, and of course, um, by the time you then pick up from, from there um, and, and really get into the deal, and then your experience and exposure 
um, will really just extend um, the length and breadth that you really want it to be, yeah? Um, I think in my view, everything that has been said is, is really just baseline um, and it's uh, um, the general concept and principles that you really need. Uh, I doubt that there would be um, any situation that you would encounter that would not require you to apply all of these baseline or basic concepts, yeah? Um, so like I said, it's basic foundation and uh, please build from here and hopefully whatever other questions you have, um, um, we are able to address it by, by tomorrow. So thank you very much, Kefa, for, for the time. Um, thank you very much, Christine, for, for, um, for doing this. I mean, I, I, I really wondered how you were able to go that stretch without a, a glass of water. Um, but I, I suppose that you are doing that right now. Thank you very much. Back to you, Kefa. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Peter, for those few remarks. Um, a note to make is that um, another session will be held in November of the same kind. We organized this year on the, on the, on the calendar to have two sessions, uh, one this month and then another one in november we will communicate we'll send out emails and also uh, alerts on our social media platforms and we'll let to you know in due time so in case any of your pals workmates did miss the sessions for today or that of to of of, of of tomorrow we'll be again here back in november Okay, having said that, I want to thank everyone who has come to join us tonight. Uh, your, your presence with us has been as, as, as energized us to, to, to keep doing what we do at Isaka Kampala chapter. We will be waiting for you tomorrow and see you tomorrow. Have a good night. <laughs>